Well, as you think about Christmas, it's coming up. Ready or not, here we come, right? Ready or not, it's going to, it's tonight and tomorrow. But as you think about Christmas, what is the perfect Christmas for you? What's the, what's contributes for your perfect Christmas. I want you to think about it. I want you to kind of get something in your mind, a picture uh, that you have of what just a perfect Christmas is. For some of you, maybe it's, um, it's the music. It's what music's playing. Maybe you're a, maybe you're a, a, a Michael Buble fan, right? I, I, uh, I appreciate his last name, except for whenever I talk to my wife, I always call him Michael Bubble, just because it's fun. So maybe you're, a, a, or, or maybe you've, uh, maybe you, just the last couple years, you grabbed on the pentatonics, man, and their voices, oh, isn't that incredible what they can do with their voices, and it's that sound, maybe it, maybe for you, you're a little bit more in the classics, and Bing Crosby is the thing, man, for you, and it's, whenever you hear that, that's just the, it just contributes to the perfect Christmas. Maybe a perfect Christmas for you is everyone snuggled up on couches and, and chairs watching a Christmas movie together as a family and you're watching one of your favorites. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Home Alone or Elf or The Grinch or maybe you're more of the classics and uh, It's a Wonderful Life or uh, White Christmas. Oh, don't ask me. I was subjected to it when I was a child. My sisters loved it and so I had to watch it every year. Maybe for you the perfect Christmas is about someone who's coming. You know, and, and maybe they're here already, or maybe they're on their way, and, and it's just going to, it's not Christmas until they show up, or when you get together with the family, it's just not Christmas until everybody's together, and for you, it's just all about being together for Christmas and, and having family time. Maybe for some of you, it's, who's not going to be there this year, and <laughs> you think about it, you're like, hey, that's... Uh, it's going to be great. They're not coming, and maybe they're in that boat. Maybe for you, it's what's under the Christmas tree, and you're not looking. You're only not only looking forward to opening up whatever gifts may be under the Christmas tree tonight or tomorrow, but you're also, man, perfect Christmas is just getting that perfect gift for somebody else, and then watching them open it. And for you, man, that's, there's nothing more perfect than, than just watching your loved ones open up gifts. And it's just fun, and especially the, the kids, and you got something special for them, or if you get something special for your spouse, and you just can't wait for them to open it, and it just it contributes to a perfect Christmas. Maybe for some of you, it's the the Christmas tree, man, as soon as that Christmas tree grows, goes up and it's lit up and de ornaments on it, man, it's just, it contributes to the perfect Christmas. Some of you guys are, are, are fake Christmas tree people and I don't even know what to say to you right now. <laughs> I just, we live in Oregon, people. We live in Oregon, all right? For some of you, it's the nostalgia of it all or maybe for you, it, it, it's about... Uh, sitting in your favorite chair next to this warm fire that's blazing and you're sitting there, man, in your favorite recliner, your favorite chair, and just, just your favorite relatives around you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. The chair doesn't really matter. It could be any old chair. When I think about the perfect Christmas I think back to the Christmases when I was growing up at my grandparents' house, and uh, we'd go up there to Seattle, and it wasn't Christmas, man. It didn't really feel like Christmas until we got there, and, and we'd get there, and it was always great. It always smelled like Christmas in the house, and my grandpa would always put up lights, and so the light house was always lit, and there was this, um, they had this really big plastic 
Santa Claus that they would stick on their front porch. And uh, this thing was, was big and plastic and jolly. And uh, it always sat there every Christmas. And man, you get there, it was for us kids. We'd go give it a, a big hug, Santa, a big old hug there. And, and it was just awesome when hanging out with cousins and playing together and having aunts and uncles and having games and food and so much, so many uh, unrestricted snacks when you were a kid was just incredible. And now that I'm a parent, I'm like, no, put the snacks away. But when you're a kid, man, it's like, they're unrestricted and I can have as many as I want and at least tell mom and dad to get down here. And uh, man, it was awesome. And then uh, we just, we had so many good memories there. But my, my grandma, she had this um, snow village. Have you ever seen these? Do you, have, do you have these in your homes where you have these little, you make up the little town, right? And there's little el different pieces that you put. Everyone know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and when you look at those um, little towns, right, uh, what they depict is a perfect Christmas, isn't it? I mean, you have the little kids ice skating, and you have the, the couple people carrying a tree over their shoulder, and everybody's smiling, and you got the, the town crier doing whatever it is a town crier does, but I'm guessing he's just over, so overcome by joy that he's just wailing, and you have, uh, you have everybody, I mean, just, just the perfect amount of snow, you know, the one that makes everything look great, but doesn't, doesn't deter travel plans, you know? <laughs> And, and it's just what they depict in those, those little villages is the perfect Christmas. I don't know what it is for you when you think of the perfect Christmas, but it's probably different for each of us, and we all have different elements probably that make up what goes into having a perfect Christmas. And, and what I want to share with you uh, this morning is that whatever you think of, when you think of the perfect Christmas, it's probably not going to happen this year. So let's just pray and get out of here. Lord Jesus, thank you. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Right? Because we build Christmas up and we have all these things go in, in our, into our minds that go into this perfect Christmas. And I don't know about your experience, but mine's been that something always goes wrong. That, that we strive to have this perfect day, this perfect thing, this perfect every, and then somebody burns the rolls, right? Or somebody... Gets in, some family members get into an argument, or politics gets brought up, or, or you have a couple people in your family that you just can't go to the same house together because they just don't get along, and so that adds to the drama of Christmas. Um, some of the lights go out on the tree. Uh, one of your swan or all of your kids get sick, then they share it, and then now you're the bad guy. You know what I mean? And, and it just goes into, and, and often what we do is we just build things up till we want this perfect thing, and then something goes wrong. For a lot of you, for many of you, um, boy, we want to have a perfect Christmas, but right now you're dealing, you're still dealing with the, the loss of a loved one, and Christmas still stings a little bit. Certainly, that's where my family's at. I'm still. For some of you, you're dealing with um, this Christmas season, a diagnosis that you never wanted, that you never saw coming, and you're sitting with it, and you don't know what to do with it. And... For many of you, this is supposed to be the happiest and most joyful season and time, and yet you feel a little bit depressed, and you don't know what to do with those emotions. You don't know what to do when everybody else is happy around you, and yet, yet you just feel sad. And for you, as much as we want to have a perfect Christmas, something always comes up, doesn't it? My question is, what do we do with that? What do we do when we are dealing with unexpected circumstances that are less than ideal and we are forced to grapple with having an imperfect 
Christmas. Or maybe this extends beyond just Christmas to our lives. What do we do when imperfect circumstances arise in our lives? You see, because I think that as we look at our Christmases and, and realize that probably not everything's going to go perfect, I think, it's, I think it's pretty similar if we look back to the first Christmas, I think we find some similarities that there, is, there was some things that took place during that first Christmas that led to having some imperfect circumstances. And, and, and I want to look this morning at, uh, at this young girl, Mary, um, and how she dealt with less than ideal circumstances, things she would never have chosen herself, but how she navigated through some of those things so that she could be in a good place, so that she could live and, and, and have a mentality that is so different than, than mine. You see, this week, as I was preparing this, really, uh, you guys are along for the ride because I wrote this Christmas message for myself. Because this is something that I battle with constantly. I'm a, a planner. I love having a plan, and I love when things happen according to my plan. Uh, and, and when things start going off the rails, when things start going sideways, I don't do particularly well, uh, just to be honest. Uh, I don't handle that always the greatest. And yet, as I was looking at this story again, the story that I've read hundreds of times, maybe you've heard this story many, many times yourself, but as I was reading it and I was looking at how Mary dealt with this, I was encouraged and it's been blessing my life this week. And so I'm gonna share with you and I hope that this, this blesses your, your life as well. We're gonna be in Luke chapter two this morning and if you wanna grab a Bible and turn there, we're spending most of the morning here. In Luke chapter two, starting in verse one, it says this, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Whenever I read that line, there was no room for them in the inn, I just feel for Joseph because you know that Mary was like, really, Joseph, you forgot to make reservations? <laughs> oh, come on, like you had, no wonder it was a silent night. <laughs> I mean, we've all been there, right, where we dropped the ball and, and so this just begins to pile up some of the imperfect circumstances that will arise, and we'll go over some of them in just a minute, but the story goes on in verse eight. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. I hope you were with us this last Sunday when we talked about that, because I believe that that message is so true, that the message of hope and the message of Christmas and the message of Jesus is for all people. And if you're here this morning, this may be the first time you walk back into a church for a really long time or you don't get it, I want you to know that the message of Christmas is for all people. The hope that's found in Jesus is for everybody. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among, tho uh, among those whom he is pleased. And the angels went away from them into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the, uh, the saying that had been told them concerning the child. 
And all who heard it wondered at the shepherds, what the shepherds told. And here's where we're gonna land, and here's the verse that just blew me away this week. Uh, even though I've read it a hundred times, this is the verse that, that stuck out to me. And Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary treasured up these things. In other words, she chose in the midst of these imperfect circumstances, in the midst of things she would have never chosen, she chose to find the hope in the middle of them. In the midst of facing things that she would have never chose, Mary treasured, she, she delighted in, she took joy in the middle of a barn when she had just given birth to a baby and had to lay this baby that in, in, in a manger. And then she, it said she pondered them. What does that mean? She meant she kept going over and over and over them and delighted in them each time. For you and I, at least for me, I can speak for myself. When things are going wrong, I, I don't know if it's called ponder, but I go over and over and over them again and again and again and try to figure out what went wrong in the situation. What I did wrong or what went wrong. I don't think that's pondering. I think that might just be obsessing. But, uh, but Mary, she did the opposite. She began to ponder. And as she pondered, she began to recognize the goodness of God and the graciousness of God in the midst of less than ideal circumstances. We think about all she was facing in, the, in this and and, and I think it's important that we pause and, and realize what Mary was going through because although Mary had some different circumstances than we have in our own life, they were equally imperfect circumstances. Does that make sense? She was going through her set of, uh, of hard times, her set of imperfect circumstances, but we do too. We have things in our life, we have things that come up that are are less than ideal. And, and often, I don't know how to negotiate those things. But we think about Mary, she was dealing with an unplanned pregnancy. She, she wasn't expecting this. She was a teenage girl getting ready for her wedding, and she had this unpla unplanned pregnancy. And, and, and with that, in her time, came the danger or even death could have be, been the outcome of this pregnancy if it was to be made known to everybody. So she was facing threats. She was facing certainly shame. She was almost divorced, if not for a decision by Joseph to stay with her. We've talked about in this series we were doing earlier this month, the shame that would have been placed on her and Joseph. And then uh, this uh, census, this, this king decides that he wants to count all the people so that he can get more tax money. And so he issues this decree that there should be a, a census taken of this entire Roman world. So everybody had to go back to their hometowns. So Joseph and Mary had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Okay, that's 80 miles they had to travel. Approximately 80 miles they had to travel. And she was nine months pregnant. Now, I don't know if you can tell just by looking at me, but I myself have never been pregnant. And, uh, but I have been around uh, my beautiful wife who's been pregnant three times, and she was incredible and, and radiant and glowing and beautiful. And, and you can tell her I said all those things because I say it to her all the time. But... Uh, but I could not, I mean, traveling at nine months pregnant from like our house to Fred Meyers in a car was, was difficult enough, right? Ladies, if you've been pregnant, you know what I'm talking about. At nine months, it's just, I don't want to go anywhere. Then add to that, she had to walk and or ride a donkey for 80 to 90 miles, I think we can all agree that's less than ideal circumstances that she was dealing with. All the women said amen, right? Men were just gonna have to believe it. Um, 
And then she gets to this town, and probably because of the walk and because of the, the donkey ride, it's like, I'm going to have this baby now, and they can't find any inns that are, have room in them. And so there's the humility of finding a, a, a stable, a, a barn, and it's probably not what we think of as a barn. It's more like a cave out back where animals would be feeding and keeping warm in. And so they, they tuck in there with, the, with the, the, the animals and she gives birth. Not in a hospital room with an epidural. She gives birth. And then she has to grab and she grabs a, a cloth that's laying there and wraps her baby in it and, and places her baby, who is the king of the world, the king of kings and the lord of lords, places him in a feeding trough for animals. And then not only that, we just read a bunch of stinky shepherds show up. Because you know, ladies, how much you love having company right after you give birth, right? And a bunch of shepherds pour in. I think we can all agree that she was facing some pretty difficult moments. It wasn't really a perfect Christmas, right? There, there was some contributing factors that took it far outside the realm of perfect for Mary. And yet, in the middle of all of that, in the middle of her dealing with all this, she found a way to treasure those things and ponder them in her heart. My question is, how in the world did she do that? How, how did she how did she take what she was experiencing and what she probably hoped for and reconcile those two things because i think if we can get a hold of that this morning I think it will help us when we walk through and we are forced to reconcile what we thought would be what we thought would be perfect and what we're dealing with right now to get that, we have to go back to the first part of this story, back almost nine, a little over nine months from the birth of Jesus, back to when the angel showed up to Mary. And we find that in Luke chapter one. And starting in verse 26, it says this, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled saying, uh, at that saying, and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be the son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Did you catch it in there? Mary actually believed what the angel said to her. She actually grabbed a hold of, and in the middle of all of that, she believed these two important truths that we find in that statement the angel brought her that I think were her anchors in the middle of the storm that would be the next nine months of her life. Matter of fact, the rest of her life would be a storm. But she found something in the middle of those that was, was enabled her to treasure and actually, actually see the good in the midst of this imperfect circumstances. First thing she came to grips with, it says it right there, the angel showed up and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary believed, she actually believed, not just in her head, but all the way down into her core, all the way down into her heart, that God was with her. That God was walking with her and that God would continue to walk with her no matter what circumstances came up. And the second truth that she held on to and that helped her navigate these storms was the angel said, you have found favor with God. In other words, God is for you. Those are the two truths that I think have radically changed Mary's life and they've began this week as I've been looking. They've been changing my perspective that God is with you 
and that God is for you. God is with you. Um, and she just believed this so much, so much so that a little bit later on in, in, in chapter one of Luke, if we drop down, um, Mary has this song that she sings. Uh, I don't know, we're not given many details of the song. We don't know what tune it was to, what, but it was Mary's jam. I mean, she like, she, and I'm sure that she had played this. You know, you guys have this song, you have a song probably, right? It's something that just gets stuck in your head and it just goes over and over and over and you just play through, you can't get it out of your mind, right? Mary, this, I could imagine that this song was what just got stuck in her head and she just played this over and over and over through the difficult moments of her pregnancy and this is a little bit of what it said starting in verse 46 of, of Luke 1. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant in other words, he says, Mary, Mary's saying, I'm going to glorify, I'm going to praise, I'm going to lift up the name of my God. And I know this, he's looked at me in my humble state. She's like, I'm nothing great, but he's great. I'm nobody, but he's everything. For behold, from now, uh, now all generations we call blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud uh, in, the thoughts, in, uh, in the thoughts of their hearts. In other words, Mary is just taking a moment in the midst of hard times and she's saying, I'm just gonna magnify, I'm just gonna praise God in the midst of this. Why? Because he is mighty, he is strong, he is powerful and that mighty, powerful, strong God is with me. And he's rooting for me. He's for me. And I think some of us, these aren't, if you've been in church for a long time, or maybe some of these truths aren't any new to you, but I know for me, I've known these things up here, but often I forget to believe them in my heart, that God is actually with me, and that he's actually for me, that he's rooting for me, that he's cheering me on. And to believe that with our core will help us come to grips with these imperfect circumstances that many of us walk through. God is with you. What does that mean? For Mary, it was a very physical thing. Think about that. Whenever she doubted whether God was with her or not, she had the physical presence of God in the form of Jesus in her womb. And as she walked along for those nine months, she had God inside of her. She experienced, and every time the Jesus kicked, she would be reminded that God was with her. You and I don't have that, but what we do have is something the Bible says is even better. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've given life to Jesus, and have become a Christian, the Bible says that we, the, that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. In other words, God comes and takes residence up inside of us and wants to live his power in and through our lives. So in a very real sense, if you are a follower of Jesus, God is with you. Literally, he is with you in his spirit. And yet so often, it, I forget that. And, and I let less than ideal circumstances and imperfect moments, I, get them, I let them overwhelm me because I forget to believe and know that the Holy Spirit's in me and wants to display his power through me. That's what it means that God is with you. David knew about this King David when he wrote, and for many of you, uh, you've heard this, and, and often this is read during some of the most trying times of our lives. Most of the time, even at funerals, this is read, right? Psalm 23, and what is Psalm 23? Part of it, David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, why? for you are with me, God. David says, even though everything is standing opposed to me and I feel like all the world is crashing down on me right now, I will fear nothing. I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. And if God is with me, I don't have anything to worry about. 
I can navigate and negotiate in perfect circumstances because I know beyond a shadow of doubt, David says, and Mary says, that God is with me. What would it be like if you, you and I started really believing that, not just with our heads, but with our hearts, that God is with me? The second truth is that God is for you and me. What does that mean? God is for you. I think it means that God is, that God is rooting for you, that God is cheering you on, that, that he is on your side it doesn't it seem like to you, at least it seems like to me, that whenever things start going wrong in life, doesn't it feel like everything's just coming against you? And we can begin to have this mentality that every, wo- woe is me, everything's piling on me. How, why, why is this happening to me? And I think what it means that God is with you means that in the middle of those circumstances, God is right alongside us. He's with you and he's cheering us on. He wants to see us overcome these circumstances. He wants to walk with us through these circumstances and see us come out on the other side more full of faith than when we went in. I'm reminded of that in the New Testament. Um, Paul writes in the book of Romans um, these incredible truths. And I just want to read it this morning, um, Romans chapter 8, because I think that, that for you and I, the promise of God's word is that he's with us and that he's for us. And, and, and I need to, this Christmas, be able to get a hold of that. And in, in Romans chapter 8, Boy, Paul lays this out, and and I've been working on actually grabbing a hold of this, these truths. Notice what it says, 8, starting in verse uh, 31. For uh, for, uh, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How will he not also, uh, also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any case against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who's inter- who indeed is interceding for, interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughters, to the slaughter. And and I want you to just, have you ever felt that way? That that things are just pressing against you and you're like, man, I don't know if, I don't know who's for me. and I don't know where God is in the middle of the circumstances. I thought he'd show up by now. I thought he would have taken care of this by now. Why is this happening to me? But Paul reminds us of this truth. He's saying, who, who can separate us from the love of Christ? What, what, quarter, what kinds of things can separate us from God? What kind of things can drive a barrier between us and God? None of these things that he listed. But he says, no, in these things, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Isn't that incredible that Paul's saying, listen, I know that things in life stack up against you, and I know things might happen that that are less than ideal. And whether that's physical things like sickness or or diagnosis or people, uh, our loved ones who go home too early or whether that's you're dealing with relational things and this Christmas you're going to be stuck in a room or in a house with people that you don't necessarily in the past have the best track record of getting along with. And you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And, and you're, you're stuck in the midst of this and you're saying, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. 
Paul's saying there is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love that Christ has for you in his son Jesus. And that as we walk and we remember that God is with us and God is for us, and, and as you walk through difficult relational circumstances maybe over the next couple days, and you just, you can't stand to any longer be around these people, think, you know what? God is with me right now in this moment. And he's rooting for me not to freak out like I want to do, but to have patience and show the love and kindness of Christ to this person right now. And although I'm dealing with sickness or I'm dealing with life circumstances or money is tight or I'm battling this bout of depression that I just don't know what to do with right now and I'm just struggling to even get out of bed, I don't know how I'm gonna go through tomorrow where everybody's gonna be happy. You can remind yourself over and over like Mary did, God is with you. He's got you. He's walking with you and God wants to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, continue to give you power and strength even when you don't have it in and of yourself and that God is rooting for you. He's cheering you on and he's for you. I think that's how Mary was able to reconcile and grapple with what she thought would be in her head as perfect and the circumstances that turned out far from it. I think there's something there for you and I. If you have been a Christian, if you are a Christian and you've been a Christian for a long time, my challenge for you is this, to really start believing and move it from a head belief to a heart action belief that the Holy Spirit is in you and that he wants to make himself known and manifest his power through you and that you can just, even in times where you feel lonely, you can know that God is with you and that he's there giving you power and cheering for you. For those of you who maybe not have, give, have not yet given your life to Jesus and you're not a Christian yet, those things are available to you through what Jesus did, what we just read about, that, that he, God, did not spare even his own son. You see, the message of Christmas doesn't end with Jesus, baby Jesus in a manger. That baby boy that we read about and, and, and have in our nativity scenes at home, he didn't stay a baby. He grew, he lived a perfect life. And he died on the cross, uh, a perfect uh, man to pay the penalty for you and I and our sins. And so that we could have hope and so that we could have the power of God dwell inside of us. And I don't know any greater Christmas gift that you could have this year than to have the Holy Spirit come and God himself come and take residency upside, inside of your heart and your life. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'd love to talk with you about that and walk through what that looks like. But I know for a lot of you, you have done that. And I just want to challenge you as you're walking through the next few days and when that perfect Christmas that you envisioned falls apart a little bit, remind yourself, God is with me. And he's rooting for me. This is a very real uh, this became very real for me uh, just in the last about 18 hours or so. Uh, everything was cruising along. We're planning, our family is planning to head out of town right after we dismiss here. We're heading up to Spokane to uh, spend time with my uh, sister and go up there and have a great Christmas. And I was really, we're just looking forward to it. And uh, and then yesterday, later in the afternoon, early evening, I got in my truck to start it, and it didn't start. And so I jumped it and, and got it um, working and drove it around, and it started a couple more times, and then I had to run and get gas after a, a, an event we went to last night. And in the gas station, they dreaded click, 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 right? And in those, that moment, I wanted to revert back to my things aren't going to my, according to my own plan. I'm going to kind of get frazzled by this, but I just kept saying, God is with me and God is for me. God is with me. God is for me. And so we got home. It didn't, mirac didn't miraculously fix the battery, by the way. Got jumped and got home and, and laid down in bed and couldn't sleep last night. Got maybe an hour or two of sleep last night. And my... Um, 
we've had in the past couple of weeks, we've had some sickness, uh, stomach sickness in our home. And so I started like, I, I don't know if I feel good or not. And I was like, no, there's too much going on tomorrow. I got to preach and I got to do this and we got to drive. And I started just in my mind doing my, this is less than ideal. This is not good. And, and I had to practice what I was going to preach here this morning, that God is with me and God is for me. God is with me and God is for me. And by his grace, I woke up and, and I didn't feel great, but I got dressed and I hear and he's gotten me through this message. And then I don't know who did this, but, and I don't even remember who I all told about this, but whoever you are, thank you. Uh, I walked back into my office after band practice and there's a battery for my truck sitting on my desk. Um, and so, yeah. And so... Uh, whoever you are, thank you. And, um, and it's just reminding me all over again that God is with me and he's rooting for me and he's got my back. And in the midst of imperfect things, boy, my mind started slipping towards this is gonna be imperfect. This is, this is tough. Things are starting to stack against me. I just continue to remind myself God is with me and God is rooting for me. He's walking with me. Even if I do get sick, God is with me. Even if the truck doesn't start, God is with me in the middle of that. And he's for me. He's rooting for me to overcome and walk through these little things, these imperfect circumstances, and to build faith as I walk through them. So I've had to live this, or this, this message that, that I wrote, I, that's why I said I think I wrote it, wrote it more for myself than I wrote it for, for you guys, but I hope it blessed you as well. This morning as we wrap down our service, um, we're going to finish with communion. And uh, I just want us to take some, some time now as we head towards the busy. I'm sure right after we dismiss, you've got plans and you've got family. And the next few hours, the next couple days are just going to be quite busy with things going on. But I just want us to pause for a moment right now and spend a few moments meditating on what Jesus, all who Jesus is, that that baby boy was born over 2,000 years ago, but he didn't stay a baby. He, was, he, raised, he, was, he lived a perfect life, and he died a sinless death, and he rose again three days later so that you and I could know beyond a shadow of doubt that God is with us and that he's for us.